episode 74. There was an outburst of squeals from the cage. It seemed to reach Winston from far away. The rats were fighting. They were trying to get at each other through the partition. He heard also a deep groan of despair. That too seemed to come from outside himself. O'Brien picked up the cage and as he did so, pressed something in it. There was a sharp click. Winston made a frantic effort to tear himself loose from the chair, and it was hopeless. Every part of him, even his head, was held immovably. O'Brien moved the cage nearer. It was less than a meter from Winston's face. I have pressed the first lever, said O'Brien. You understand the construction of this cage. The mask will fit over your head, leaving no exit. When I press this other lever, the door of the cage will slide up. These starving brutes will shoot out of it like bullets. Have you ever seen a rat leap through the air? They will leap onto your face and bore straight into it. Sometimes they attack the eyes first. Sometimes they burrow through the cheeks and devour the tongue. The cage was nearer. It was closing in. Winston heard a succession of shrill cries which appeared to be occurring in the air above his head. But he fought furiously against his panic to think. To think, even with a split second left, to think was the only hope. Suddenly, the foul, musty odor of the brutes struck his nostrils. There was a violent convulsion of nausea inside him, and he almost lost consciousness. Everything had gone black. For an instant, he was insane, a screaming animal. Yet, he came out of the blackness, clutching an idea. There was one and only one way to save himself. He must interpose another human being, the body of another human being between himself and the rats. The circle of the mask was large enough now to shut out the vision of anything else. The wire door was a couple of handspans from his face. The rats knew what was coming now. One of them was leaping up and down. The other, an old scaly grandfather of the sewers, stood up with his pink hands against the bar and fiercely sniffed the air. Winston could see the whiskers and the yellow teeth. Again, the black panic took hold of him. He was blind, helpless, mindless. It was a common punishment in Imperial China, said O'Brien, as didactically as ever. The mask was closing on his face, the wire brushed his cheek, and then, no, it was not relief, only hope, a tiny fragment of hope. Too late, perhaps, too late. But he had suddenly understood that in the whole world there was just one person to whom he could transfer his punishment. One body that he could thrust between himself and the rats. And he was shouting frantically over and over, Do it to Julia! Do it to Julia, not me! Julia! I don't care what you do to her! Tear her face off! Strip her to the bones! Not me! Julia! Not me! He was falling backwards into enormous depths away from the rats. He was still strapped in the chair, but he had fallen through the floor, 
through the walls of the building, through the earth, through the oceans, through the atmosphere, into outer space, into the gulfs between the stars, always away, away, away from the rats. He was light years distant, but O'Brien was still standing at his side. There was still the cold touch of wire against his cheek. But through the darkness that enveloped him, he heard another metallic click and knew that the cage door had clicked shut and not open. End of chapter five. Chapter six. The chestnut tree was almost empty. A ray of sunlight slanting through a window fell on dusty tabletops. It was the lonely hour of fifteen. A tinny music trickled from the telescreens. Winston sat in his usual corner, gazing into an empty glass. Now and again he glanced up at a vast face which eyed him from the opposite wall. Big brother is watching you, the captain said. Unbidden, a waiter came and filled his glass up with victory gin, shaking into it a few drops from another bottle with a quill through the cork. It was saccharin flavored with cloves, the specialty of the cafe. Winston was listening to the telescreen. At present, only music was coming out of it, but there was a possibility that at any moment there might be a special bulletin from the Ministry of Peace. The news from the African front was disquieting in the extreme. On and off, he had been worrying about it all day. A Eurasian army, Oceania, was at war with Eurasia. Oceania had always been at war with Eurasia was moving southward at terrifying speed. The midday bulletin had not mentioned any definite area, but it was probable that already the mouth of the Congo was a battlefield. Brazzaville and Leopoldville were in danger. One did not have to look at the map to see what it meant. It was not merely a question of losing Central Africa. For the first time in the whole war, the territory of Oceania itself was menaced. A violent emotion. Not fear, exactly, but a sort of undifferentiated excitement flared up in him and faded again. He stopped thinking about the war. In these days, he could never fix his mind on any one subject for more than a few moments at a time. He picked up his glass and drained it at a gulp. As always, the gin made him shudder and even wretch slightly. The stuff was horrible. The cloves and saccharin, themselves disgusting enough in their sickly way, could not disguise the flat, oily smell. And what was worst of all was that the smell of gin, which dwelt with him night and day, was inextricably mixed up in his mind with the smell of those... He never named them, even in his thoughts. And so far as it was possible, he never visualized them. They were something he was half aware of hovering close to his face, a smell that clung to his nostrils. As the gin rose in him, he belched through purple lips. He had grown fatter since they released him, and had regained his old color. Indeed, more than regained it. His features had thickened. The skin on his nose and cheekbones was coarsely red. Even the bald scalp was too deep a pink. A waiter, again unbidden, brought the chessboard and the current issue of the Times, with the page turned down at the chess problem. Then, seeing that Winston's glass was empty, he brought the gin bottle and filled it. There was no need to give orders. They knew his habits. The chessboard was always waiting for him, 
His corner table was always reserved. Even when the place was full, he had it to himself, since nobody cared to be seen sitting too close to him. He never even bothered to count his drinks. At irregular intervals, they presented him with a dirty slip of paper, which they said was the bill. But he had the impression that they always undercharged him. It would have made no difference if it had been the other way about. He had always plenty of money nowadays. He even had a job, an easy job, more highly paid than his old job had been.